Hello and welcome to First Baptist Church in Port Hope, our first get-together, such as it is, of 2021. Let's begin by praying. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the ways in which it is possible for us to connect with each other, even in times when we can't be in the room together. We thank you that your word does not change, that the hearts that you give us for each other do not change. We pray that you will continue to speak to us in the ways that only you can, and that we will be changed to change the world. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. The reading is John chapter 8, verse 3 to 11. As he was speaking, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. They put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The laws of Moses said to stone her, what do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him, but Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. They kept demanding an answer. So he stood up again and said, all right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he stooped down and wrote in the dust. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, neither do I, go and sin no more. I have to say that this is not how I would necessarily have chosen to begin 2021, sitting in my office by myself, recording a sermon into my phone where the only face visible is my own, such as it is, the building is empty <clears throat> and very, very quiet. <laughs> Silence can be a beautiful thing. If we have the luxury of choosing silence, it can be restful and peaceful and, and an opportunity for us to just think our own thoughts with no pressure and to relax. But in the silences that we do not choose, silence has a weight to it. It can be heavy. It has a substance that, that we push back against by, by talking to ourselves or humming or turning on YouTube or the radio. When a friend has been silent for too long and we haven't heard from them, we start to wonder if something is wrong. When God has been silent for too long, we start to wonder why. And that wondering can turn to doubting, and that doubting can turn to looking for answers somewhere else. You may have found, as I have at times, this past year that God seemed a little too silent that there were prayers that seemed to go unanswered, problems that seemed to go unaddressed, and help that never seemed to come. You may find looking forward to the new year that you find it difficult to contemplate continuing to wait for answers, asking and not receiving. You may or may not find it comforting to be told that this is not new, that throughout our faith journey, we often find times when God seems silent, when we pray prayers that are unanswered, that all throughout the history of our faith, all throughout the history of God's interaction with humanity, there have been times when God was silent. 
For example, Elijah. Elijah was uh, a great prophet. He was one of these remarkable people, hand chosen by God to represent him and to, to speak God's words to God's people. And even God's hand-picked prophets could encounter God's silence. I think of a time when um, Elijah had just experienced what is arguably his greatest success as God's prophet. He had faced down 450 opposing prophets who represented a false god and who had the backing of a hostile queen who hated Elijah. But Elijah had stood up to these people and just in a quiet prayer, speaking to God, he had called down fire from heaven that had consumed rocks and water and earth. And just days after, just days after that, that incredible public display of God's affirmation and, and God's calling on Elijah's life, Elijah was running away. He was running for his life because Jezebel was not impressed. And she had put a price on his head, and Elijah panicked. He ran away, scared, lonely, tired, giving up. He curled up under a tree and literally asked God to let him die. God did not answer that prayer. God was silent. Another person who encountered God's silence was uh, a woman we only know as the Canaanite woman. <laughs> she faced God's silence. Jesus had, uh, in his ministry, in his work, he had traveled out of Israel <clears throat> to a different region. And interestingly enough, this was kind of the hometown of Jezebel, Elijah's arch enemy. And centuries later, the, the Israelites and the Canaanites were still at odds with each other. The Israelites considered the Canaanites to be cursed by God because of some things that had happened long, long before. And there was an ongoing history of, of tension and mutual contempt. And the Canaanites worshipped uh, idols, and the Israelites worshipped Yahweh God. So from a Jewish perspective, um, this woman was an outsider, ethnically, religiously, in every way. <clears throat> but when Jesus came to her area, she somehow knew who he was, and she started to follow him, crying after him, crying out like a mother will, my daughter is sick, help me. And the disciples who were following Jesus, they knew that, that she had no right to be making demands of Jesus because of who she was. She was starting to get on their nerves, and they asked Jesus to send her away. So what did Jesus do? He ignored the woman. He didn't talk to her. He talked about her to the disciples. And he said to them, in effect, yeah, she is not my problem. And the Canaanite woman was faced by God's silence. Someone else who encountered God's silence was the woman we only know as the woman caught in adultery. Don't you wish somebody had written down these women's names? Jesus was on his own turf this time, very much so. He was in the, the great temple in Jerusalem, and he was seated, as rabbis were when they were teaching, because people would come around to hear what he had to say. And in this moment of teaching, this woman was dragged through the crowd up to the front where everybody could see her standing and waiting for judgment. She was undoubtedly guilty in the letter of the law of a capital crime. 
And maybe she was just resigned. Maybe she knew there was no point. So, um, you know, she didn't ask for leniency, ask for mercy or explain herself. Maybe she was just defiant. Maybe she just thought there is no way I'm going to give these people the satisfaction of hearing me ask for mercy. So she said nothing. She did not speak in her own defense. But in that moment, Jesus didn't speak to her either. He didn't acknowledge her as a person, just as the object of an interesting legal debate. He didn't ask her name. He didn't comment. He didn't condemn her. He didn't reassure her. God was silent. And a little while later, when Jesus himself was on trial, again, for a capital offense, from a distance, his response looks a lot like hers. When he was accused, he did not defend himself. When he was questioned, he did not answer. And when he was mocked, he refused to talk back. So Pilate, who was a civil servant just doing his job, and Herod, who was a spoiled nobility just looking for a good show, and the priests and religious leaders who were doing their best to protect what they thought they were supposed to protect, they were all confronted by the silence of God. One of God's great faithful servants with unanswered prayer. A woman who was an outsider in every way, ignored and dismissed, brushed off. A woman who was an insider, but objectified, dehumanized, used. And a group of educated, knowledgeable, powerful men disappointed and silenced themselves by the silence of God. But for each, each of these people in turn, God's silence presented a challenge. It presented an opportunity. It gave them a choice to make of how they were going to respond. Because when God is silent, he's silent for a reason. He's silent for a time, and then the time comes when God speaks. The time came when God spoke to Elijah. When Elijah had crawled out from under his tree, when he had run as far as he could run, when he had hidden in a cave, when the earth had been shaken and shattered by wind and fire, and when all the noise had died down, then God spoke and he said, No, no, Elijah, it is not time to die. You are not alone. There are thousands like you. Go and find them and trust me. God's silence ended when he said no. But then he said yes to something so much better. The time came when God spoke to the Canaanite woman. She wasn't a fool. She knew she was being shrugged off and ignored, but she did not give up. She was bold enough or desperate enough to argue with God, to argue with Jesus, to push back against his silence, to get in his face and be persistent and to even use his own words to make her point. And God's silence ended when he said, yes. The time came when God spoke to the guilty woman. She hadn't spoken to him. She hadn't begged. She probably knew there was no point in confessing or asking for mercy. But Jesus' silence created space for her to consider where she was 
how she had got there and what the cost was going to be. Jesus gave her the responsibility of pronouncing her own sentence. I am not condemned. <laughs> Jesus' silence silenced the voice of death, silenced the voice of guilt, silenced the voice of powerless, hopeless defiance. Jesus' silence made space for the inner voice of the Holy Spirit and of conscience. God's silence ended when he gave her the choice to begin again. And the time came when God spoke long after his trial had ended. Because he had done all of his speaking long before it had begun. Jesus' silence at his trial, I think, was the voice of a broken heart. One commentator called it the silence of tragedy. Because Jesus knew that these men already knew the answers to their own questions. They had all along been listening so closely to everything that he said during his ministry, everything that he said about himself. They had been watching so closely everything that he did, every miracle, every gesture of kindness. And they had completely missed the point. Jesus' broken-hearted silence made space for them to remember, to consider, to connect the dots. But there was nothing else for him to say. He only broke his silence on the cross when he spoke to the people who loved him and who he loved. When God is silent, there's a reason. When God is silent, there's a challenge and an opportunity. When, like Elijah, I am faced with my own exhaustion, my own despair, do I curl up and pray to die? Do I keep running? Or do I turn towards help and home? When, like the Canaanite woman, I hear others' voices telling me, well, what did you expect? What did you think you deserved? You had no right to even ask. Do I just accept that and walk away from what could be? Or do I hold even tighter the things that I know he has said about me and to me? Do I continue to speak those things in persistence and in boldness? When, like the guilty woman, I stand self-accused, self-judging, do I just take ownership of my own guilt and wrap myself in defiance and, and keep on down the same road? Or do I seize the opportunity to begin again and to follow Jesus as he does the work of repairing and rebuilding? When, like the people who put Jesus on trial, I'm faced with the question, who do you say I am? Do I stand on my own cleverness and sophistication, my own strength, my own accomplishment, and dismiss everything that he has said about himself? Or do I take the chance that maybe I don't know everything and maybe I've been wrong and maybe I need to let go and trust him? Why? <clears throat> Why is God sometimes silent? 
I don't think there's an easy answer. There are as many answers to that question as there are situations in which we find ourselves asking it. But when it comes down to it, God is God. And he doesn't actually owe me anything. But he does give me the opportunity to make choices. To ask, what is he asking me? What is my response going to be? And when he breaks his silence, what am I going to hear him say? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the times that we hear your voice so clearly and so simply. Whether it's from the words of scripture or from other believers who come alongside us and speak into our lives. It's more difficult to thank you for the times when you're silent. Because in those silences, we have hard work to do. You haven't abandoned us, you haven't left us alone, but you have given us work to do. We pray that you will point out to each of us, point out to me, the places where I've let that silence fester when I've let it be an excuse for going in the wrong direction. Please forgive us for the times that we have failed to trust you. Please speak into us in whatever way you see fit, what we need to hear and what we need to know. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.